so um, I want to welcome all of you to the presentation this evening and it's very nice that all of you came out in the rain and the cold and you must be very motivated to learn about seals and sea lions. Um, so I have, I'd like to see a show of hands for how many people have visited Children's Pool and the Cove in La Jolla. Okay. And um, if you've noticed, there's a difference between the way the harbor seals at Children's Pool space themselves and the sea lions at the cove space themselves piled on top of each other. You guys are kind of more like harbor seals tonight because you're in little groups and then you have a lot of space and little groups and, and a little bit of space. And what's interesting about that is th that's a social spacing kind of preference that people make, that animals make, um, that within an animal wildlife or domestic animal culture, that's one of the things we note about animal behavior is how the individual animals space themselves. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is marine mammals, uh, mostly seals and sea lions, a little bit about whales and dolphins, and some community opportunities if people want to get more involved, either on an education basis, on a volunteer basis, different kinds of groups that do different things, different kinds of projects and activities. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The other thing I want to mention at the outset is that marine mammals, um, they're mammals, they're air-breathing animals, and yet they live in the aquatic environment. And this is a very, very fascinating and unusual feature for these animals because they can remain underwater for long periods of time. They can dive to very deep depths depending on the species as to how deep they can dive. And again, they have lungs. They don't have gills like fish. So how they are able to function in the water and go down a depth of a mile, for example, uh, as a northern elephant seal can do, is a pretty fascinating and amazing capability. So what I'm going to start with um, tonight is just showing you some videos um, that are going to highlight some of the different subject areas we're going to be speaking about throughout the lecture. Um, the first one is a general introduction to seals and sea lions.
So we're talking about organizations. Um, there's an organization I'd like to mention called Ocean Defenders Alliance. Um, what they do is they look at all the debris off the coast, discarded fishing gear, discarded batteries, tires, all kinds of nasty things that end up in the ocean, and they have volunteers who go out and collect that debris, try to clean up the habitats so that fish and other wildlife have a more natural and safe environment for living. So we will start with that one. I'm Sylvia Earle, an oceanographer, explorer, explorer in residence at the National Geographic, and founder of Mission Blue. I'm also a supporter of the Ocean Defenders Alliance. One thing that the Ocean Defenders Alliance really focuses on that is so important is retrieving ghost nets. This organization does a great job of going out into the ocean and hauling back the debris, the plastic, long lines, the discarded nets, the fish traps, killing thousands of birds, mammals, fish, and other ocean wildlife. We have to give back to the ocean. In 1999, I was on a, just a recreational dive. It was up in Anacapa, and there was a, a lobster trap down there, and this trap was abandoned. They had been in there for at least four months, and they were going to starve to death or get eaten. So I started trying to get them out of the trap, and I wasn't familiar with how to handle lobsters, so I was struggling with it. Some divers saw what I was doing, and they came over and helped me get the, the lobsters out. And when we got to the surface, it was the talk of the boat. And that was the genesis of how I came up with the idea to clean up more of this gear. Hi, I'm Kurt Lieber, president and founder of Ocean Defenders Alliance. Ocean Defenders Alliance removes abandoned commercial fishing gear. Ghost gear continues to kill animals long after it's discarded. This is an example of a squid net. Nothing gets through here, not even a minnow will get through this. And we find pelicans in here, cormorants, and obviously fish and sea lions. We found six dead sea lions in one of these things. When the storms come in and they wash this gear all over the place, it scours the reef and kills everything that can't move out of its way. We have a boat called the Clearwater. It's a 40-foot ex-Coast Guard rescue vessel, and it will handle six divers, as well as three or four crew members. The divers go down to the bottom, and they uh, attach lift bags to the nets and, and the lines. They fill the lift bag with air, and then they send it to the surface. One of the highlights always for what we do is when you release a fish. It's not just the diving that is hard. It's removing the nets off of the boat that is difficult. They weigh a lot. Uh, we've had some instances where we've removed nets that have weighed a, a thousand pounds. One of the most rewarding things about what we're doing is going back to an area where we've been working for sometimes years and going back and seeing huge fish that hadn't been there before we started working on them.
Okay, that's an example of one um, organization, a nonprofit organization that takes volunteers, whether divers or people doing other kinds of things, and that's a community effort trying to address something that has to do with science, marine mammals, and ocean wildlife. Um, so we're now going to um, look at another video. And we're going to take a look at mother and baby seals. of their young. When pups are first born, they nuzzle the pup to establish a tactile and olfactory bond. They frequently kiss or press noses to continue this bond while on land and in the water. The pups are born on land and go into the water to swim, usually within 15 minutes of birth. Mother seals teach their young how to navigate both the land and the water, as well as other survival skills. Harbor seals are true seals, which means that they have no external ear flaps, have short flippers, and move with difficulty on land, although they are fast and agile in the water. <laughs> Understanding the behavior and biology of marine mammals such as harbor seals is essential to understanding how to protect the ecosystems in which they live, and thereby to help protect coastal and nearshore land environments and habitat. Okay, and um, before we get to some of the other videos here, that little pup is um, less than three days old. And the way that we can tell that is when you saw the pup in the grass flailing around, um, you can see the umbilical cord stump. The umbilical cord stump is there for 72 hours and then it falls off. 
unless a seagull comes and wraps it off in a painful thing for the pup before then, which does happen, by the way. But that's some of how we gauge in, in the wild how old a pup is. There are other things having to do with the size and how much fat and so on it might have on it, um, if it has a wrinkled appearance. But one of the most reliable ways to determine if a pup is three days old or less, three days old or more, is whether it has the umbilical cord stump. So um, the other thing I want to point out in that video is the eelgrass. Um, as many of you know, um, the ecosystems in our coastal areas have kelp and a variety of ocean plants and eelgrass, and that type of eelgrass is actually a protected type of eelgrass. Um, that provides kind of a nursery for small fish, small crustaceans, um, and it is a place, because it's coastal and uh, away from the heavy waves and so on, that mother seals will take the babies so they can learn about the ocean currents, about the rip currents, and different things. So there's a lot of information in that video. Um, going to show you one now that is unfortunately not very good in terms of technical quality but it shows something about social behavior of pups and mothers. Um, harbor seal pups don't really associate with other pups. They pretty much pay attention to mom. That's how their culture, their social structure is set up. Some of them are pretty compliant. Um, they're paying attention to mom all the time. Some of them have a mind of their own, little Dennis the Menace type of pups. And the two that I'm going to show you here, and again, I apologize, the quality of the footage isn't that good, but the content is important to show that there's a variation in personality, even in wildlife. Um, so there are two rambunctious pups that you will see with mom trying to get them out of the water, and the pups are not having any of it. So little toddler behavior.
wildlife has a life. They have a social life. Um, they have complex things that they're involved with, and that's the comical side of it because they have a tough side to deal with as well. Um, there is one other thing here that I want to show you that seems to have disappeared. So we will look at this one. This is a leopard seal in Antarctica. I'm going to show it to you again to see the locomotion. And as some of you may know, we sometimes have elephant seals, young elephant seals that are migrating seals that stop by. And this is a young elephant seal at the cove in La Jolla. And these are the seals that um, the males develop the big proboscis and they um, grow to a size of 5,000 pounds. They're up in central California, and the males can dive to a depth of one mile, and they can remain underwater for two hours. And again, these are air-breathing animals. So we'll talk a little bit about how they're able to do that um, in just a moment. Marine mammal science and the community. We've already had a hint of that with some of the videos, especially Ocean Defenders Alliance. Um, we've talked about how they breathe air, they function in the aquatic environment, some of them also function on land. So pinnipeds like seals and sea lions have to come out uh, in a process called hauling out. They haul out, they come out onto a land surface uh, whether it's a beach, a flat rock, uh, a cliff in the case of a sea lion, an ice flow if it's Alaska and harbor seals are coming out. Uh, the same thing in Antarctica, um, seals and uh, in some cases sea lions, but mostly seals come out on the ice in Antarctica. And I'm sure you've seen these guys. These are sea lions. Mother and baby harbor seal, baby harbor seal, mother and baby harbor seal. This is bonding behavior between the baby and the mother. Uh, sea lions on a cliff, and you can see they have to deal with pretty intense waves and ocean action. Baby harbor seal, baby harbor seal. The other color phase of a baby harbor seal. So besides potentially being a diver or becoming involved with a group like Ocean Defenders Alliance. There are other things that people can do to be involved with marine mammal issues. Um, there is volunteering with docent organizations. There are groups like the American Cetacean Society where you can go to lectures and talks and go on trips and so on. Um, and there's citizen science. Um, what happens with that is um, there are opportunities to work with an entity, an organization, maybe an agency with the government, um, to go out in the field to be trained and to collect data. Um, an example of this is um, there was a study done in San Francisco uh, in the Bay at a location called Strawberry Spit about 20 years ago, and they were looking at the effect of building apartment buildings and public walkways to see if that was affecting a harbor seal habitat that was in that area. The harbor seals were leaving and showing signs of distress. Um, so there was a study that was done and some of the um, data was collected by people who lived in the area who were trained to observe certain precise kinds of things, to take counts of animals at certain times, to um, take notes on different behaviors and so on. So that's an example of citizen science. And there are various opportunities to do that. Um, in Hawaii, if, again, people are divers. Um, 
people are studying manta rays. They're also studying them in, in the South Pacific. Manta rays have uh, a unique spot pattern on their underside, and they're doing a study to try to identify as many individuals as possible. So there are volunteers involved with identifying uh, through photo imagery and other kinds of notations, individual manta rays. So they can learn something about where they go, what their different behaviors are, and so on. Um, track their life uh, events and this kind of thing. Uh, there are many different kinds of citizen science. Um, with birds, for example, um, there are opportunities to, to watch on critter cams. Um, eagles um, in a nest, the eggs when they hatch, what the behaviors are between the babies and the, the parents. So there are many opportunities to get involved in fascinating studies. Marine mammals in the United States are basically managed by the federal government. Um, and there's something called the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 that basically determined how marine mammals were going to be treated. Prior to 1972, marine mammals in the United States coastal waters were hunted. Um, for over 100 years, seals were killed for $5 a nose on both coasts. Whales were killed, all kinds of things happened, and many marine mammal populations really were decimated. So in 1972, the Marine Mammal Protection Act uh, came into existence, and it provides guidelines and regulations for what's going to happen with marine mammals in the United States. Some marine mammals strand. Either they're entangled in fishing gear, or they're entangled in something else. Um, they might be sick, they might be injured. Different rescue and rehabilitation organizations take care of these animals and have to follow certain rules. And these organizations have to be permitted by the federal government. But many of the organizations work with the help of many volunteers. So an example of one such organization is the Pacific Marine Mammal Center in Laguna Beach, um, the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito. Um, all of these organizations are part of what's called the Stranding Network. And um, as you go up and down the coast, the different counties or different areas along the coast, both coasts of the United States and um, also um, other areas, um, basically, depending upon where you are, there's a different stranding facility that will manage animals that are having a problem and presenting in this way and beach themselves. Um, and many of these um, groups and organizations also, again, rely very heavily on volunteers um, to go and observe an animal that's been reported uh, they're trained in some cases to, come, to go out and pick up the animal. And again, this is all done with permits that the organization has from the federal government. But that's another great opportunity for people who want to do something as a constructive activity with marine mammals. Um, there are um, opportunities for ecotourism. There are other kinds of wildlife rescue groups, such as Project Wildlife and Wildlife Assist in San Diego County. We also are very lucky to have um, scientific conferences that come here. Um, the Society for Marine Mammalogy was here some number of years ago. That's one of the biggest organizations in the world uh, that presents many scientific papers and has a lot of projects going on for students as well as um, faculty and so on, um, and they were here for a five-day conference um, some number of years ago, but there are many um, organizations like that that uh, bring many professionals and experts together um, for conferences, and that's something else that you can uh, learn about and attend, and they're fascinating. They have workshops where people can participate, ask questions, and so on. Um, there's another group that I would recommend to all of you, which is the American Cetacean Society uh, for people who are interested in whales and dolphins. Um, there's a wonderful San Diego chapter, 
and they have regular meetings. That's another opportunity to go and hear speakers, um, learn about the different projects and activities that they have going on. Even if you're not going to volunteer with a rehab center, many of these rehab centers um, do have tours. They're open to the public. Um, and also you can book a tour and get a behind the scenes look and see some of how they take care of the animals. Again, seals and sea lions are pinnipeds. The word pinniped means fin-footed, so we see the little flippers. That's what they are. And uh, that group includes seals, sea lions, and walruses. Um, cetaceans, whales, and dolphins stay in the water. Uh, pinnipeds have to come out of the water, and they have to come out of the water for really critically important physiological reasons. One is they just have to rest. Um, they have fur. Whales and dolphins don't have fur. Secondly, um, because of their unique anatomy and physiology, they have to warm their bodies. They have a very thick blubber layer, but they do have to come out and warm their bodies. Um, another reason that they have to come out and rest on land is they have to reoxygenate their blood. Part of how they are able to dive and to remain underwater for extended periods of time and dive to different depths is that they carry a lot more oxygen in their blood than humans and other terrestrial animals. So as an example, uh, harbor seals carry four times as much oxygen in their hemoglobin, the way their hemoglobin is constructed, um, than humans. So they're carrying a store of oxygen. And when they're on land, they are basically refilling their oxygen tanks. They also have something in the muscles called myoglobin, also that allows them to store oxygen. So that is basically their scuba gear, when, you know, in a physiological sense, when they're underwater. Um, seals and sea lions, two different groups, actually they, um, they're cousins in a way, but they have different evolutionary paths. So seals basically um, developed from weasels and other kinds of land animals. Sea lions developed from bears. So they have some relationship, some similarities, and some things very different. Um, so the two types are phocids or true seals and harbor seals such as you see at the children's pool. Those are phocids or true seals. They have little holes on the side of their head. That's their ear area. By comparison, a sea lion has a flap, an ear flap. So that's one of the ways you can tell a seal as opposed to a sea lion. Seals or phocids have tiny little flippers and they have to drag themselves on land. Um, sea lions have those big flippers, and they propel themselves differently on land and on the water. Sea lions actually can rotate their hips in the back so that when they're in the water swimming, their body is in a certain kind of configuration. When they come out on land, they rotate their hips, and that's how they're able to walk and lift themselves up on those big flippers. Um, so there are quite a few differences. Um, sea lions tend to, to not dive as deeply uh, because of their physiology and also what they eat and what their various habits are. Um, so they're more surface animals. Uh, phocids are the ones that dive with, for example, northern elephant seals, they'll dive to a mile. Harbor seals will dive typically to 500 feet and they can remain underwater for 30 minutes. Um, there are people who've noted that harbor seals uh, in certain parts of the world can dive to a depth of 2,000 feet. So again, this is part of why these animals are incredibly fascinating because we look at them on land and it's a furry animal and it's breathing the air and it's kind of doing ter terrestrial kinds of things, but once they get in the water they're doing very, very different kinds of things. So. There are a lot of challenges that these guys face, and it's wonderful to watch them um, being cute with their moms, 
Um, one thing I want to say about um, harbor seals and birthing is that the gestation period for harbor seals is between 9 and 11 months. So they have something called delayed implantation. That means when the egg is fertilized, it may not implant immediately. It might float around in the uterus. And um, that's why it will be somewhere between 9 and 11 months for the gestation period. And a reproductively active female will give birth just to one pup a year for a certain number of years. Um, the pups are between 18 and 24 pounds, more or less, when they're born. Sometimes they might be born in a slightly premature state, in which case they're going to be covered with a kind of a woolly coat that's called a lanugo coat. Um, and that's shed. Um, if, the, if the pup is full term, it's typically going to be shed in the womb, and then the pup will be born. Sometimes it's shed, um, and the pup is full term is born with that lanugo coat and it will be shed after birth in a, in a few days. Sometimes it's an indication that the pup is slightly premature. So it does depend upon the situation. Um, and you look at other features with the pup to see if it's full term or if it seems like it's slightly underdeveloped or small. Harbor seal pups stay with the mother for between four to six weeks and it's necessary that they get the nutrition so that they can put on weight, uh, so that they can stay alive, basically. And the mom takes them around um, and teaches them things about how to forage, uh, how to operate in the land environment, how to operate in the sea environment. So the time spent with the mother is very, very important. Sometimes we do have situations that we see where a pup is abandoned. Um, that could be due to disturbance that has spooked the mom. It could be due to a wide variety of other things. And in some cases, pups are rescued. Um, in our county, the Stranding Center is SeaWorld. So um, if you see a distressed, either a baby animal or an entangled animal, entangled adult, SeaWorld is um, the Stranding Center for San Diego County, and those are the people to contact if you want to do something to help the animal. Sea lions, um, the pups stay with the mothers for between eight months and a year. So they have a different learning curve and a different nutrition curve with their mothers. Um, and most sea lions, California sea lions, are born out in the Channel Islands. And then sometimes they, at different life stages, make it over to the mainland and have uh, different colonies. Where the animals come out of the water and rest is called a haul-out site. And that activity is called hauling out. If it's a location where pups are being born and raised, it's also called a rookery. So some haul-out sites are just for resting and all these other functions that I've mentioned. Some of them also are for birthing and for nursing the pup and raising the pup, and those are rookeries. So when pinnipeds are in the water, they're foraging. Um, they're engaged in courtship at certain seasonal times. With harbor seals, um, the way they do this is they slap the water with their front flippers. They put on elaborate displays of slapping the water with their tails. Each species has a different way of engaging in courtship. Um, many pinnipeds actually mate on land rather than in the water. Harbor seals are um, a little bit more unique in that they mate in the water and engage in the courtship in the water. Here we have harbor seals spaced out, kind of like you guys. Um, again, sea lions um, tend to pile on top of each other. Now, <coughs> elephant seals and um, other types of pinnipeds um, are not coastal. Um, harbor seals, California sea lions, stellar sea lions, monk seals, many of these are coastal. So they live near the shore. They don't really venture that far. They might travel, say, between the Channel Islands and the mainland back and forth. Um, the pelagic seals and, and sea lions um, only haul out seasonally. 
and they are really very amazing again with their physiology. So elephant seals go out to sea for months at a time, come back to, to land basically twice a year, but spend most of their time at sea. Fur seals actually are sea lions, and they similarly spend most of their time at sea. One of the things we know about haul out is that um, for the coastal pinnipeds, it is really critical to their survival. And studies have been done with captive harbor seals um, that basically prove this point. Um, there's a study where the harbor seals basically were deprived in a captive setting of an opportunity to haul out. Um, and then after some period of time, they were allowed to haul out again in this captive setting. And what they did was they made up in good measure for the lost time, which would suggest that um, this is really critical to their survival. They really need to be able to reoxygenate their blood. They need to rest. They need to manage their temperature and so on. Typically, it's going to be coming and going throughout the day, but it's going to be usually a total of about eight hours, and it would be the same for harbor seals. They, they typically will need to haul out a total of about eight hours a day. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, with mothers and pups, that's going to be a little bit different. They might need to be hauled out a little bit longer because they have to nurse and the pup can't stay in the water that long. Um, but it's going to be an average of eight hours a day. Elephant seals and fur seals have a lot more blubber. Mm -hmm. uh, the way their body is constructed, um, they handle their warmth issues and the oxygenation, all of these things we were talking about. Their whole physiology is different than a coastal pinniped. So um, they're able to be out at sea. A lot of it has to do with that huge blubber layer. When you see a 5,000 pound <laughs> northern elephant seal, um, there's a lot of blubber there. So um, they basically are constructed differently. That's how they're able to do it. They come to shore primarily to, um, to, to mate, to give birth. Um, their pups are born generally December, January, March, February, that, that range uh, for northern elephant seals. And um, the pups are with the mothers only for about 30 days. Then the mothers leave because they really are not eating. Um, with harbor seals, the mothers go out and forage with the pup, and they're teaching the pup how to forage. With elephant seals, they don't. So they feed the pup for a month, and then they leave because they're going back. Wow. So the weaners, you have then what are called weaner groups, and they kind of have to help each other learn how to how to survive, and hopefully they've put on trial enough and trial and error. That's right, that's right. So hopefully they've put on enough weight to help sustain them through a period of time where um, they are, um, they're weaned and they have an opportunity, trial and error, to learn how to survive. Now, one of the things, you know, related to that is, let's say you have um, a pup that's been rescued young, maybe not weaned yet, maybe has just been weaned, is in a rescue center, but really hasn't learned how to feed itself. Well, the rescue centers have something called fishing school. Seriously, that is what they call it. When the pups are weaned, they're called weaners. So not like a hot dog, but because they've been weaned. They're called weaners. And they tend to group themselves together and help each other out, and it's called a wiener group. But actually, so in the rescue centers, they have fishing school, and they'll take a big plastic, like a kiddie pool, for example, that you get at Target, and they'll have the little young seals in there, and they will have to make sure that the animal knows how to catch a fish, how to ingest a fish, because in the case of harbor seals, they swallow the fish whole. So they have to make sure that these animals can take care of themselves. So if they've come in because they're underweight or they're dehydrated or have some other number of issues, um, you know, they can 
take care of some of their medical issues, they can take care of feeding them, this kind of thing, but they need a skill set so that they can survive once they're released. So they go to fishing school. I just want to show this example of bottling behavior. Um, and I'm sure if you've been at children's pool, you've seen seals kind of, they're vertical and their noses are up and they're just kind of, you know, enjoying the day, or maybe not. Um, but that's called bottling. So that's one of the things that they do to rest in the water. If you've been to the cove and you've seen the sea lions with their flippers extended, does anybody know what they're doing then when the flippers are extended? Um, they have a lot of blood vessels in the flippers and it acts as kind of a radiator. So if they're too warm, they're letting out excess heat. And sometimes you'll see them actually in a circle, a group of them together and their flippers are up in the air and they're letting out excess heat and that's how they're regulating what their physiological needs are. Okay, does anybody know what that is? Not a fur seal. No. We're going to see a fur seal in a minute. That's a Weddell or Weddell seal pup. It's from Antarctica, and that's a real cute little baby. That's a <laughs> faucet, <laughs> and um, he's got little ear holes on the side. He doesn't have ear flaps. Uh, Weddell seals are really, really fascinating. There are some very interesting studies going on um, currently. Um, about some of their capabilities. So they haul out on the ice in Antarctica and then they swim under the ice. And the question is, how do they navigate? How do they know how to come back to where their hole opening is? And, um, you know, some of the studies suggest that they have visual cues under the water, you know, there are different features under the water. Um, there are other suggestions that are being looked at um, that they are using either the Earth's magnetic field that somehow they can perceive in some way or other types of electrical or magnetic signals that help them to navigate and to know where they are underwater. So they're really, really fascinating studies going on and again these animals that live in such varied climates and conditions have very specialized um, adaptations that basically allow them to survive. You know, the deepest diving marine mammals in the world are the northern elephant seals, and in the whale world it would be sperm whales. Um, and I don't think that sperm whales go down a mile, I'd have to look that up, but um, pretty darn close. Okay, here's an example of a lanugo coat. So you can see the head of the seal, you see the features and the spots and so on, and on the front flipper you can see a little bit of the, um, the silver fur with the black spots. But the rest of the body is kind of more monotone. That's the lanugo <coughs> coat that's, um, that's wrinkled up there, and that's what's going to fall off, and then the pup is going to be spotted all over when it falls off. So that's a, a typical coloration of a lanugo coat. Uh, okay, here we have an example again of bonding behavior. So these again are harbor seals and the mother and pup are touching noses. That's part of how they bond. It's olfactory and it's also tactile. And again, you see they have the little ear holes. That's a pup that's way more than 72 hours old. It's a fat little pup and you can see the short flippers. By the way, harbor seals are only seen in the northern hemisphere. Here we have an endangered pinniped, which is the Hawaiian monk seal. And that's a little baby monk seal with a mother. And these guys are really studied very, very carefully in Hawaii because they are endangered. They're um, the pinniped in the United States that is endangered. Um, there's another endangered marine mammal that I'd like to mention also, which is a whale, which is the North Atlantic right whale, that are very seriously endangered. Um, their numbers are very, very low. They're in the northeast. Um, they are frequently caught in fishing line. Um, there are many instances where they're hit by boats. 
Um, and this is all being studied um, because there obviously is a concern among scientists that they don't want these animals to become extinct. And, you know, there are very serious concerns with their population level at this point. And I think we're at our little fur seal. So that's a little northern fur seal pup. And he's got his little ear flaps because he's really a sea lion. And you can see that his flippers are bigger and they don't look like what a faucet looks like. And again, we have sea lion, big flippers. Sea lion, big flippers. Sea lion, big flippers. Sea lion with his little ear flaps. Another thing I want to do is um, speak a little bit to the point of um, vocalization. Um, these animals are all very social. Harbor seals have a kind of a quiet, timid way that they operate, but they do have vocalizations, and that's how they communicate. The mother and pup have certain sounds, particularly the pup will make certain sounds. The mother will recognize her own pup and the unique sounds that it makes. Um, they have grunts and growls and different noises like that. But one of the very fascinating things that's been studied about them is they have very complex vocalizations underwater. And the acoustical patterns of the way they emit sounds underwater have been studied and what scientists are looking at is whether that is in some way correlated with where an animal is in a social structure. And it does appear that uh, certain types of sounds are made by a higher up animal uh, in the social structure. And when that animal emits certain combination of sounds, um, the, the animals lower on the pecking order are going to respond to that animal in its location differently. There are different kinds of roars and rumbles okay. and grumbles, and they have, you know, if you looked at it on an oscilloscope, you'd see a certain combination of amplitudes and frequencies and so on. And also, seals and sea lions have um, vocal cords, but whales and other cetaceans don't. So does anybody know how it is that they are able to vocalize and make sounds? Because we know that humpback whales have songs that are heard for many, many miles. And um, does anybody have any idea about that? And part of the answer is scientists don't really know. But they do, without vocal uh, cords, have sound that resonates in the different parts of their face and head and so on, and that's what produces the sounds and the humpback song and so on. So their vocalizations, as I'm sure you all have read, are very complex and very precise, and um, you know, dolphins communicate with the clicks and the different sounds, and whales communicate with a whole variety of, of other sounds. If you go to the Birch Aquarium, um, how many have been to the Birch Aquarium? It's been a while. Great. And have you been to the exhibit where you can pick a different whale or dolphin and listen and the, the exhibit will let you hear the vocalization that the animal makes. So that's something I'd highly recommend um, is to go and listen to some of those vocalizations. They really are amazing. Here we have a harbor seal on an ice floe in Alaska. I want to talk a little bit about tags. Um, this is a little young sea lion. And what's unusual here is he actually has um, tags on both front flippers. Um, he is possibly a research animal. I actually don't know. I wasn't able to find out anything about him. But in most cases, these animals have just one tag. Um, sea lions are tagged on the front flippers. And phocids or true seals are tagged on the rear flippers. So the system for that lets an observer, if they see an animal that's tagged um, from a distance, you know, obviously they can see if it's a seal or a sea lion, 
but again, that's an added point of information. So again, front flippers for sea lions, rear flippers for the tags for phocids. Um, also, um, for male or female, um, the right flipper side is um, tagged for a female, the left flipper side is tagged uh, for a male. I don't know where this animal was from. On the side you can't see, he also has a brand, which you know would probably not be done. I, I can't say for sure. I, there are a lot of I don't knows about this animal. Um, but it's possible this was a research animal in some way and was tagged that way for a particular reason. Um, some of the other things about research with these animals, uh, you know, there's field research that involves observation, basically standing there with a clicker, counting animals, um, studying something called population dynamics. Um, does anybody know what that is? Population dynamics would not be a count, but it would be you have a group of animals on the beach, how many are adults, how many are male, how many are female, uh, how many are you know, full adults, how many are sub-adults, how many are yearlings, how many are pups, that kind of thing. That's population dynamics. Um, so you can stand there with a clicker, you can take notes on different aspects of what they're doing, they're raising their head, they're moving in this way, they're responding to sound in a certain way, um, that kind of thing. For the underwater studies, um, there's a lot of telemetry that's been developed. So um, sometimes these guys, um, if they're in a rescue facility, for example, when they're released, they'll have some type of telemetry attached to them in addition to their regular tag. Um, and that can give scientists an idea of where they go, what they're doing for a period of time until the animal molts and then the tag, uh, the, the monitor falls off. Um, sometimes, for example, elephant seals are um, fitted with monitoring devices. Um, students from different universities that are studying elephant seals might be on a project where they'll actually go out into the field. Um, they'll sedate an animal. They'll take blood and take different measurements and so on. Um, they will apply a, um, a certain type of substance that allows the telemetry device to attach for a period of time until the malt when it's released. Um, and these are very sophisticated devices, so that's part of uh, where we get the information about how deep they dive, um, you know, where they go, uh, how often do they surface, when are they under the water, this kind of thing, tracking their movements geographically. So that's the use of telemetry. So for the seals, they don't really have that much of an obvious sexual dimorphism. Um, the males might be a little bit bigger, but primarily um, you have to look at their underside. So the male um, will have a hole here and the female won't. Um, when the female is about to give birth and obviously has a big belly, uh, little nipples will start to pop out just maybe a day or so before she gives birth. But the rest of the year, primarily, you have to see the underside of the animal to see if there is a, what we call a male hole. <coughs> Or, or not. Um, for sea lions, um, up until a certain age, they're all kind of going to look alike. Um, when they start to get to the point of sexual maturity, the males will develop what's called a sagittal crest. So um, the females will have kind of a smooth face, forehead area. The males will have basically a big knot on their head that's called the sagittal crest. And with an adult male, you'll be able to tell, okay, that's a male and that's how you do it. Um, one of the videos that I had wanted to show you is an interview with Sharon Young, who is um, the main marine mammal expert with the Humane Society of the United States. And um, one of the things she's talking about that I wanted to show you is ocean noise. But the other thing she was talking about was toxin loads. And um, when animals strand, um, you know, it could be due to entanglement, they might have an injury, they might have a shark bite. Um, in many cases, um, they strand uh, due to illness of some kind. Um, one of the things that's being studied now um, 
are a lot of the diseases that are showing up in sea lions, a lot of cancers, a lot of other things like that. Um, so when the animals strand, veterinarians have a chance not only to help that animal, but to try to learn about these trends that may be going on in the environment and see if those are related to health patterns. In the San Francisco Bay Area, there is something called red coat harbor seals. Is anybody familiar with that? Okay, red coats, um, basically um, the head and the neck area are kind of a rusty red because they literally have iron oxides on their fur. And um, scientists are studying this to see why that is. There are studies going on to see if there are certain pollutants in the water or in the food supply that certain animals are sensitive to, that's why they develop that coat. Um, again, these are works in progress. These are the kinds of questions that scientists are asking about these animals because um, these animals are considered in some ways indicators of what's going on in the ocean, what's going on in the ocean environment. And Though these are some of the questions that scientists still have. So I want to get down here and show you some environmental concerns, <coughs> some of what's going on in the ocean. And I'm sure you've all heard of the Pacific Garbage Patch. Who has heard of the Pacific Garbage Patch? OK. So out in the middle of the Pacific, um, there's an area that covers many, many acres and is really quite deep. It's just a collection of plastic and garbage and stuff that the currents have brought into this one area. And it's part of the environmental hazards that all of these animals have to contend with if they're in those areas. I want to show you some rather important pictures, though, that the coastal pinnipeds show us. This is part of, <laughs> uh, does anybody know what that gull is doing? Well, the placenta. So when the harbor seals give birth on the beach and there's an afterbirth delivered, uh, the gulls come and basically they take care of it. We have a little baby sea lion, and he might be a little bit underweight, but you see all that stuff on his head? And that's tar. So um, the tar could be... Um, along the Pacific coast um, from one of two sources. One could be an oil spill, but also it could be natural. Um, and they'd have to do a forensic test on that particular tar to find out because there are um, petrochemical seeps off the coast of Santa Barbara. So if this animal has been in that area, um, they could have acquired the tar on their fur naturally from that geological um, situation. So, you know, the, um, the pups are very cute. It's very endearing to watch these animals. But um, here we have an example of a uh, fishing line uh, cutting into that animal. But these animals have a really, really tough life. Um, and one of the things I want to wrap up with here, and then I'll find these final pictures, is that um, people see them on the beach and they think, oh, look at that animal. He's got the life. He's living on the beach in La Jolla, you know, or wherever it happens to be. These animals have a really tough life. They have predators going after them. Um, they have issues with food supply. A number of years ago, we had what's called a UME with the uh, unusual mortality event with sea lions, where we had lots of baby sea lions coming ashore, very skinny, many of them dying because there was an issue with their food supply. We have pollution, chemical pollution. We have noise pollution. We have entanglement. We have propeller wounds on animals. We have boat strikes on animals. We have many things in the environment having their food supply uh, change, move to another location, whatever. 
So these, these animals have a pretty tough life. And one of the things I'd like to leave you with is just the idea that um, their life is very complex. The world that they live in is very complex. They're living in two worlds. They're living on land, and they're living in the water. And I just would like to share this sense of having an appreciation of the many things that they have to deal with on a daily basis in what is a normal, you know, life for themselves. So um, anyway, thank you all very, very much.